I want to start with where we are. Welcome to Dreamforce, Lori. This is my first time. This is your first Dreamforce. It is, and like, and what? Are you surprised? Yeah, actually, to be honest with you, I am because really, really large tech conferences scare me. And there's something about what this. is the most exciting thing at this no, Dreamforce? No, I'm doing the interview. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you this. What's interesting about you is we want to do the interview in like a quiet setting, and you are one of the few tech CEOs that I know who wants to be around people. Like I know that seems like a very like weird concept, but like a technologist. I love our community. This is like our my family, honestly. Salesforce has an ethos, and you have these things that you go back to that kind of studying you, I, I've learned a little bit about. And, and one is you think we've entered the fourth industrial revolution. Um, this idea we have that- We have, we have entered the fourth industrial revolution, you're right. This idea that we are defined by connectivity. So I'm gonna put on my ethics We're hat. We're all connected, Lori. I mean, well, let me put on my, my ethics hat. I mean, so as we enter this brave new era where we're all connected, what do we have to be careful of? Who are the people that are gonna be left behind? Well, the number one thing that in the fourth industrial revolution, and you know, we've had three industrial revolutions before this. We had the first revolution, steam, and then the second revolution of work, and the third revolution of computers. And here we are in the fourth revolution, and the fourth revolution is everything is connected. And if we already know everyone and everything is connected, but now every product is connected, everything is getting connected. And so it's a new world, but we're all going forward together into that world. Yeah, it's, it's uncharted territory though. And, and I, uh, having covered tech for all these years, I always worry as we enter this world and as we get more connected, who are gonna be the people that miss out? So as someone who thinks about this all the time, who are you worried about? I have a huge feeling of responsibility thinking about how do we practice inclusive capitalism? How do we bring everyone with us? How do we bring every race and every gender and every sexual orientation every religion, how do we bring everybody into this new future with us? How do we leave nobody behind? And that's one of the huge themes of this conference. And um, we see and we're measuring the level of inclusiveness that we have. Capitalism, it seems to me, watching all of, and, and the time I've covered tech, it's like I like the band before the band got cool, right? You guys got cool, you became the billionaires. Now there's so much responsibility here. So as you kind of enter this new era, I mean, what are the, the main things you need to think about? What are the things that we need to be very, very careful, don't get lost in the mix? Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're focused on public schools. I mean, these kids in our public schools have got to come with us into this revolution. And if our schools are not at the standards necessary where they understand what this is all about, we're not gonna be able to bring them to us. And that's why you know, we've invested heavily in our San Francisco and Oakland public schools, and why we say to every CEO, you need to adopt a public school also. Why I've personally adopted a public school. Every executive on my management team has adopted a public school. I mean, it starts with public education, especially in our country. Um, yesterday, I was listening to your business, your speech, which by the way, I don't want to call it a business speech. It felt more like a TED talk. This is a very Mark Benioff thing to do. It's not like a, a business speech, it's a TED talk. Um, and you, you kept saying that this culture is built on trust. I know trust is a really big deal for you. It's hard for me. I look it's at this- It's a big deal for all of us. You know, I mean, like, if we don't have trust and we don't have that foundation of faith, we're not able to really all work together in the fourth industrial revolution because when everyone and everything is connected, okay, you're gonna have to really think about, do you trust what is happening? Do you trust these companies and these products that are in your home and in your car and what's going on? Do you really trust what's happening? I mean, I gotta tell you, Mark, I don't 100%. Look at what's happened in the last couple of years. How can we put all our faith in big tech when in the last years, it doesn't even seem like some of these companies know the impact of their own algorithms. I mean, you know the company I'm talking about, but it certainly seems like, how can we Each and every trust? company and each and every CEO needs to ask one question. What is really important to you? What do you really want? What are your highest values? Well, what, what, is, what, do you stay, what are we gonna build in terms of a fabric? Uh, for this industry and where we're going together. But you speak more. You speak more openly than other CEOs. Is that? Is, do you think more tech CEOs need to be a little bit more open about this type of thing? I mean, you are sitting here calling out people left and right, which is why I'm glad to, to sit down with you. But it certainly seems to me it's harder than ever to get folks to say something, even if they're talking about it behind closed doors. 
I just want to be able to articulate, and by the way, I've done this my entire career, it's not anything new, exactly what is happening right now and what we all need to become aware of and what is going on. Our whole world is changing, we realize that. This is the fourth industrial revolution. It is a new set of values, trust and success and, and innovation and also a huge focus on equality. Are we about the equality of every human being? Are we, is that what the fourth industrial revolution is about? And I think it's kind of the metaphor of the social networks is great, actually. When they started, they're talking about it's nirvana, everything is wonderful, we're going to connect everybody together. Now we find out they're not uniting us, they're dividing us, you know? That they're not maintaining our data, that they're selling it, you know, that there isn't privacy, you know, that there's a, basically a huge ecosystem people of, who are harvesting the data for personal gain. So let's get clear, what are we really doing here? What is really important? That's where we are right now with all this amazing technology and how are we gonna improve the state of the world? We all realize we have a lot of work to do, not just with each other, but even on our planet. You know, we have pl oceans that are turning into plastic and forests that are turning into highways. Uh, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna use all this technology to improve the state of the world? For me, I see this trend of technologists trying to make technology feel more human. Um, is that something that, that you're trying to do, get tech and to just feel a bit more human? Well, I think technology is gonna feel completely human. It already is. Today, you have technology that is indistinguishable from human beings. You don't know, and it's been demonstrated, if the person who's calling you on the phone is a computer or a person. It gets back to the concept of trust. When will every company say, our highest value is the trust that we have with you? Our customers, our consumers, our governments have to say the same thing, our citizens. That is, there's nothing more important in this revolution that we have than the trust we have with each other. Um, it cannot be violated. And for companies and CEOs that aren't able to say that, then let me tell you what's gonna to happen to them. Their employees are gonna walk out, and they are. Their executives are gonna walk out and they are. Their customers are gonna walk out and they are if they don't trust them. So if your highest value is something other than trust, like let's say it's power, you know, and all you care about is the monetization of your company or your social network or whatever it is, but it's not really about the trust and integrity that you have with your, even your core employees or your top executives that you work with every day, you've got a serious problem and every CEO is going to have to address that. Um, I almost this is the new world. I get the sense that you were kind of referencing Facebook there. Was that, was that I'm really Facebook talking to, all these other I'm really companies? talking at a meta level and not even just the technology industry. I'm talking about every industry because technology is every industry now. You said something in May that I thought was striking. You were talking about Google and launching this new AI and, and how many technologists around here, I know you guys all go to the dinners and jam on these things, how people said we that do. they thought, that's true. You know, that they thought that it passed the Turing test. For me, I'm like, that is mind blowing. So I ask you, because I think you're kind of my ethics advisor for the afternoon, <laughs> as artificial intelligence and voice devices get more intimate and yeah. feel more human and could be mistaken as human, what is the single most important ethical question we need to ask about it? Well, are we going to require every piece of technology to identify itself that it's technology? That this is technology, or this is a political ad, or this is a bot? I mean, on social media now, I don't know who is a bot and who is mostly human. And <laughs> I hope that when you're, you know, texting me, it's you, Lori, but I don't always know. And I think that that's a big, uh, a big question mark. And I think that's where the government is going to have to step in. Companies are going to have to step in. NGOs are going to have to step in. And to your point, ethicists are going to have to step in. I mean, do you think there should be a law that requires? I know that this is something that came up in the congressional hearings with Jack Dorsey, where one of the senators, the most striking thing to me they said was, will you require uh, people, users to understand if they're being contacted by a bot. And Jack Dorsey said, we're thinking about that. You, how what you is there to think about? Look, where, where is the line? You know, why are we not building more trust? Why are we not building more faith? And that is going to be the big question mark. And I think that it doesn't also need to come from the government, it needs to come from within the industry. Do you trust this industry to self-regulate? Someone just the other night said to me, we as technologists have to self-regulate. I gotta tell you, I'm looking at the last couple of years I don't and trust I, don't... The, I don't trust the industry to self-regulate. I already said, yeah. 
when I was at the World Economic Forum, I said, Facebook is the new cigarettes. It's not good for you, it's addictive, you don't know who's trying to convince you to use it or misuse it. The government has to step in and regulate it. And Facebook has proven that to us, even since I said it over nine months ago, over and over and over again, that they need to be regulated because they're not self-regulating. And that's true of a lot of technology companies. I don't think there's anything wrong. Look, we have those examples in every industry. Why is technology going to be the only industry that the government isn't going to step in to make sure that there's fair practice and truth and trust with consumers or businesses? You have to get there. And when the technology is getting so powerful, they're going to have to step in and do that. But I, I also watched the senators grill Mark Zuckerberg and thought, oh, dear Lord, do they actually have an understanding of technology? So I feel complicated about well, it. Well, maybe not these senators, but the millennial senators yeah, that are coming sure. do. Right. You know, maybe these are not digital natives, these senators right. and these Congress people. But I am confident that there are senators and Congress people and presidents and everyone else who is coming into the future who are digital natives and who will understand this. So you either change now or you will change later, but you will change. The critics of Facebook say fundamentally uh, the business model of Facebook is broken. You can't make money and also achieve Facebook's mission. What do you think? I, I don't know the detail intricacies of their, you know, engine room. All I can say is at a meta level, we have to operate with values. And every company and every CEO needs to be able to articulate what is really important to you and are you congruent as a CEO, as a board of directors, as a management team with your values. And look, we see it. We saw CEOs here blow up. You know, great CEOs that we we're all very excited. I'm not, I don't have to go through all the stories, but you've seen multiple CEOs who've had to leave their companies about three blocks from where this convention center is because there was a discretion, error, discretion issue on their values. Starting with, are they treating women correctly in their companies? How about right there? Do we have gender equality? Is there equal opportunity? Is there equal advancement? Are they actively preventing sexual harassment? Are they paying men and women the same? Not just in your industry, in my industry. That, you know, that, that's a great way to start with trust. Do you have gender equality? Are you taking care of your communities? Are you taking care of your public schools? Are you taking care of the environment? You know, you have to understand, Lori, why I feel so passionately about this. Why? Business is the greatest platform for change. I so strongly believe that today. Business is the greatest platform for change. And when you can unite business and NGOs and nonprofits and government, all the stakeholders, and we can have a real multi-stakeholder dialogue, we can, we can be all committed to improving the state of the world. What we've seen about with data in the last couple years, and you, sp you spoke about this at the beginning of our, our chat, do you think that we fundamentally have to reshape our view of privacy? I think we have to fundamentally reshape our view of business. How are we committed at a much deeper level that business, the business of business is not business, but the business of business is improving the state of the world? If you start from there, then you can answer your question, which is, of course, we have to go much deeper on privacy. We have to have phenomenal privacy regulations. Look at what well, I'm a huge advocate and I'm supported what just happened here in this great state of California, or we have the best privacy law in the country. But why does Europe have a better privacy law with something that they have called GDPR than we do here. I've called for a national privacy law in the United States. We need a national privacy law. We can't just have it in California. Every company needs to be held to a new level of capability in privacy. This is, we're in this new world. Why is our government not moving fast enough into that world. You're part of this group of business CEOs that take a stance. Um, I know you, you take stances that can oftentimes be political. Um, you guys have been criticized for doing business with U.S. Customs and Border Control. Um, that's not anything new to you. I know we, there are protesters outside. Is there a moral line that you will draw at some point when it comes to this particular This case? is so critical to me and how I think. Let me explain how I think. Okay, we have 171,000 people here at this conference. We have 15 protesters outside, that's the number. To me, those people who are those 15, they are just as important to me as the 170,000 here and the 10 million online. 
The only way that we create change in the world is if we bring everybody in. And I have personally engaged with those activists, talked to them, called them, they're on the record of saying that. Every employee who calls me or talks to me about a complex ethics issue, I engage with. So much so, I just made a huge change in my company. I just created something that I think every company and every CEO has to do. I just created something working directly for me called the Office of Ethical and Humane Use because I'm getting a lot of phone calls. Well, is this organization using your technology ethically? Is that organization using them ethically? And our employees will say and have anxiety, whoa, will this organization, a bunch of employees just quit because they found out they're working on government issues and they weren't even being told what's going on here. Take me into this office. Like, okay, you must so get now, really interesting calls. What are the calls you're getting? Well, what's you, an example? Every possible call that you can imagine. And I've taken them myself. And I said, you know what we need to do? We need to create a structure. You know, just how I have a department of marketing, I have a department of sales, department of finance, I have a department of philanthropy, one of the first. I have a chief equality officer, also one of the first. This is one of the first offices of ethical and humane use of technology in a technology company. But every company needs this because when you unleash AI and you unleash these ethics issues and privacy issues and all the things that you have done a great job talking about, how are we going to field that conversation? We have to do it structurally. That's how businesses have to. So we have to have the opportunity now to bring all those people in. The activists can come in and the ethicists. That is, let's bring in the great NGOs, the Amnesty Internationals, the Green Pieces. We're gonna bring all of them in, we already are. And our universities who have phenomenal ethics departments and philosophy, or philosophy departments. Everybody's in, bring our employees in, let's have the conversation, let's create change. That is how we are gonna do it together. Multi-stakeholder dialogues creating multi-stakeholder action. Nobody is going to be left out of our tent at Salesforce. Not one person. So take me into the room where it happens. Take me into one of these ethical issues. Well, you, you, we all saw the horrors at Charlestown, what happened, right? It was a terrible situation and a, and a terrible black mark on our country. And when that happened, a number of our employees said, well, do we do business with hate groups? Now, in our terms of conditions and everything, we've always said, no, we don't do business with hate groups. We are not in the business of hate. If we're about trust and faith and love, we're not about hate. We have very clear values of how we operate. So we looked at, do we have any one using our product who is a registered hate group? And we did, and we didn't renew their agreement. And I think that's very clear. Like, you're gonna have to make decisions. And by the way, my technology peers the, the, many of them are starting to make those decisions as well, especially in regards to artificial intelligence. In artificial intelligence, it can be used in many, many ways. Lori, technology is not good and it's not bad. Technology is not good and it's not bad. It's what you do with the technology that matters. It is a tool, just like every other tool human beings have created over centuries, okay? But we're gonna to have to make a decision, okay? How are we gonna use this tool? Because it can be used in any direction, especially the new technologies, not just the information technologies. This is also true of the biotechnologies. Those are in the fourth industrial revolution as well. This is, covers them all. When you think about artificial intelligence, I know Elon Musk has his whole thing on how he's so scared he's gonna, you know, it could take over the world. What is the thing keeping you specifically with AI? What keeps you up at night? What is the thing that if we do not get on top of this, we're all in a lot of trouble? Nothing keeps me up at night because I actually have tremendous faith that we're going to work all, that this is all going to work out and that we're going to use the technology in a positive way. We're going to heal our environment, that our oceans are not going to be plastic, that somehow we're deforesting at one acre per second right now and we need those forests to suck down the carbon from this incredible economy that we have, that we're gonna figure out how to reforest, that we're gonna figure out how to have the ethics in our technology, that we're gonna figure out how to make all of this happen, and that that is kind of the story of our civilization, that we're presented with these challenges, but that we are way more powerful than we realize.
And because we, we are more connected now than ever, that we can use our power and our connectivity and these technologies to create a more, a more just world and a healthier world and, a, and also a healthier planet. You and your wife recently uh, bought Time Magazine. So take me into the head of Mark Benioff. Is it, you can say yes, no, is it legacy? Is it fear that people like me are gonna cease to exist? Is it responsibility? What, what, if you could define it, what would it be? Well, I mean, for me, I have my own values. And, and you, you know, I have my spiritual values. I have deeply you know, connected to things that matter to me. One of the things that really matters to me is having a positive global impact. And um, I had been speaking to the owners of Time Magazine, Meredith Corporation, they had bought it in January, and we'd been having a conversation about a number of their assets that they held, and it just was clear to both of us that the values of Time were so deeply connected to our personal values that we would be good stewards of this historic and iconic brand. And I do, I value storytellers like yourself, I value journalists, I value photographers, I value the artists. I actually think that they are the ones who are going to get us through this, not the technologists. It's people like you and them, okay, who are going to paint the mosaic that we're all going to march towards. And Time Magazine is one of those artists. So, but it, because it's people like me, I have to ask you the question, right? How do you ensure that as we go forward, as you own you know, parts of the media, that there is no overlap, that you take that step back, that if we were gonna write the worst thing in the world about Mark Benioff and Salesforce, that we wouldn't have to be concerned about Mark Benioff. I'm not gonna be editorial involved at all. I'm not gonna be operationally involved at all. I've already met with the management team and told them that. I want them to be unshackled. I want them to be free. Time Magazine, by the way, what it is today is not what it was because as Time Magazine became more successful, the entrepreneur started to create more magazines out of Time Magazine. People Magazine, which is a great magazine, was just a page in Time Magazine. And Sports Illustrated and all these things came out of Time Magazine. And Time Magazine has had really artificial constraints around it. I want those editors and writers and photographers and visionaries to be free and to really help us to and guide us. You know, I think Time Magazine has a history of being a trusted guide for humanity and I just want them to continue to do that. And I think that they're great at doing that and people are naturally attracted to that brand of time to do that and that's what I want them to do and that's all I want them to do. I want to get to some personal questions, but one last question in this vein. I hear you speaking sometimes, and I and I see that Donald Trump was elected president, and I think like, could Mark Benioff be president? Would you ever, would you ever become a politician? You're very flattering, but let me just say one thing to you. <laughs> just give me a yes or no. What do you think? I, no, because let me tell you why no. Okay. Business is the greatest platform for change. Look at what I can do here that I could never do in any other position that I have, and we have an amazing foundation. You know, Salesforce when we started it, we put one percent of our equity. 1% of our profit and 1% of our time into a 501c3 public charity. Well, now that's millions of hours of volunteerism, a quarter billion dollars in grants. We run 40,000 nonprofits and NGOs for free on our service. It has a huge positive impact. That business, and now I've recruited over 3,000 other companies to copy that 111 model. That's what I love. And I can work with all, not all, all these other CEOs, I'm trying to get them, and I've been successful at doing it in many cases, to think about things like adopt our public schools, think about gender equality, what are you doing you know, for LGBTQ equality, how do we create more diversity inside our companies, how do, we, how do we improve the state of the world, that is the true role. And don't forget about our planet, the, the poorest person you know, on our planet is the planet itself, it's absorbing all of our pain. How do, we, how do we take care of the planet? That's what's important to me. Before there was this Mark Benioff, there was another Mark Benioff. I want to go back to, let's set the scene. Mark Benioff, mid-20s, before all this. <laughs> um, you're the youngest VP at Oracle. I just turned 54 yesterday. Uh, mid-20s sounds good, Don't Lori. worry, I'm sure tech will just change all that. You got, you'll be aging backwards oh, if wow. you guys are doing something right. That will be great. You're the youngest VP at Oracle. Um, and this is before you built out Salesforce, before billionaire Mark Benioff is sitting in front of me. What goes through your head on your last day when you're leaving Oracle? 
Well, what, what was really going through very deeply in my last day is I had an amazing experience. In my, the morning of that last day, I was working in public schools and we were doing something called Net Day. This was a long time ago, 1998. And I, we were wiring schools and preparing them for computers and networks. And then in the afternoon, I was at, back at Oracle writing software and selling software. And I was trying to get all of those people who are writing software and selling software to help me with the schools. And I couldn't do it and I realized that, wow, it's just not the culture. And I'm like, if I can do one thing when I start Salesforce, I want to bring these two things together. I want to integrate them so that I can have a business that does well and does good at the same time. That was my number one goal when I started the company. But were you afraid? Because I think so many times it's so easy to look back in the rear view mirror and say, I did this, you know, this made sense. But when you're going through that messy middle, as Scott Belsky likes to call this, it's really hard. I mean, were you, were you nervous that you're walking away from this rocket ship? How did you deal with that? Every day, I start my day with mindfulness and meditation, and we do that even at Salesforce. Every floor of every office building we have worldwide, there's a mindfulness room. The reason why is we're more connected than ever, you know that. We're all on our phones, including me, and social media and email. I know that more than ever because of Apple's new operating system now tells me my screen time, amazing. And let me tell you something, Lori. Every day, I do my best, and I'm not perfect. Take 30 minutes in the morning to do some mindfulness, clear my head, and try to regain my beginner's mind. That is, let go of the stress, let go of the anxiety, let go of what is bothering you. Let go of everything that is happening right now and just come back to the present moment. Come back to right now, in the now, coming back to my breath. It's hard as a CEO. And then, and then in that moment, I want to know, do I have a beginner's mind? Am I looking at everything from the beginning? And, and then as I was coming down to the end of my career at Oracle, and getting ready to start Salesforce, I heard a consistent voice in my head when I got to the beginner's mind. Time to start your own company. You need to do it now. And I always then will check in with you know, my family and my key friends and other advisors and say, is this really the time? And then I'll say, yeah. And then I did it. So, and I have trust in myself. And I know many people do. That's they have hard, faith, though. And That's... then you take the leap. Having trust in yourself isn't exactly the easiest thing. You say it with such gravitas, but, but a lot of people don't, and that's really difficult. Oh, well, I went in and I saw my father, and I said, he's, he's no longer alive, and he's an amazing person, had a huge impact on my life, and one of my key mentors, and just loved him with all my heart and soul. And I said, Dad, I found it inside myself. I'm going to leave Oracle. It, I've got the vision for Salesforce, for the cloud, 111. It's going to be amazing. What did Dad say? Mark, do not do this. Are you crazy? You have a great job. You have an amazing office. You work for this incredible person. You're having a huge impact for the world. Why would you even consider? He was a child of the depression. He had seen the worst of the worst. And he told me, no, don't do it. And I said, Dad, I've got faith in myself. I need to do this. And then he said, OK, go for it. And he did. So, and I did. And here we are. Um, and we have, we have this great. We have this great company and it's been so, so powerful. Everything about you is larger than life. I mean, even being in here, there's like, a, I, I'm having trouble looking at you because there's a gigantic built-in tree behind you. <laughs> You're arguably one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world. Thank you. Make us feel, no, 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 don't worry. I'm going on the opposite direction. Okay. Make us feel a little bit more human. When, when have you failed? And, and not broadly, give us a specific. Like oh, every day. In fact, I just had a situation this weekend. Tell me. Where, well, I was at an event and I asked somebody who I have a lot of respect for. I won't go into the details, but somebody who's a key person in my life. And we were in a group of 30 people and we're getting ready for Dreamforce. I'm sure I had a lot on my mind but I, I don't think completely that was the situation. And I asked a couple of hard questions, and not about this person, okay, but just about a program that I've been participating in for the last six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And the person felt that I was deeply attacking them and that I was hurting them. And it was shocking to me. And they sent me this ter horrible email afterwards. Why are you attacking me? Are you a terrible person? And I immediately called the person and said, I'm so sorry, you, forgive me, I didn't realize that I, what I, and that's one of my failings is that sometimes 
with that largesse and that big personality that when I'm with others, I can say something and I don't realize you know, that you know, I can impact them not just in a positive way, but potentially in a negative way. And I have to fall on my sword way more than you realize. I have to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. I made a mistake. I, I, and I, by the way, that is something that happens on a regular and consistent basis. And I just, you know, and I look for it so I know, and I'm happy that, by the way, that this person could tell me that because the most troubling time is when they'll tell me maybe years later, why were you attacked? No, no, I'm sorry. Sometimes that happens. These things that make you great also can lead to the worst. And, and I've been covering entrepreneurs for many, many years, and something I don't think folks talk about is this idea that some of the people that are the lightest, that are the most successful, and have the, capa the capability to completely change the world are, are also capable of the darkness, are capable of mental health issues, depression. A lot of these things kind of coincide, and no one talks about it. Um, as someone who's very spiritual and as someone who thinks about these things, I'd, I'd just be curious, is that anything that's ever impacted you or, or people close to you? And what would be your advice to folks? I see that everywhere. I see that with my employees, anxiety, depression, adverse pregnancies. I see it through my family. I see it if it's in our whole society. And that's why we have to, you know, disconnect. And I have family members who'll turn to me and say, Stop texting, stop, get off your phone. And I'm like, whoa, I'm as guilty of this as anybody is because it's all got us right now that if we're experiencing anxiety or depression or some other major mental health issue, start by turning off your device. You're friends with Elon Musk. I feel like you should be having this conversation. I have, I love him. Have I love you, Elon Musk. You have you told him this during this time? It I absolutely like have. I've, I've had a lot of great conversations with Elon Musk and Elon Musk is somebody who's amazing. We all know that. I mean, an incredible person. But just as Ariana Huffington has said to everybody now, get some sleep, calm down, it's all gonna be okay, but let's make sure we don't get so wound up in the technology we somehow forget who we really are. When we look back in history, how will we define this era of technology? I think that this is, you know, we talked about it's the fourth industrial revolution, but it's the struggle that we're having with all this new technology how do we use it for good? And that's how we're gonna define this era, that this was the era when we were struggling and all these things that are kind of out there where we have all these amazing new technologies like artificial intelligence and cloud computing or on the, on the bioengineering side, CRISPR. How are we using these for good and how do we reduce whenever possible how they're being used for bad or, or other, other things that we don't want in our world? Mm -hmm.